Number three, Tommy Kane. Thomas Kane, who went by the name Tommy, was born in Montreal, Quebec, Canada in January 1974. He played football in high school in Montreal. He then attended Syracuse University, where he played wide receiver. During the 1988 draft, the Seattle Seahawks picked him in the third round, 75th overall. Over four seasons, he played 57 games for the Seahawks. He had 142 receptions for 2,034 yards. He also had nine touchdowns. His fourth season was cut short due to knee and ankle injuries. The Seahawks ended up cutting him at training camp in 1993. In 1994, Tommy Kane played for the Toronto Argonauts in the Canadian Football League. He only played five games with them and then retired. Nine years later, in 2003, 40-year-old Tommy Kane was living in his hometown, Montreal. He was married to Tammy Shake, and they had four kids together. However, in the autumn of 2003, Kane and Shake were not together. Kane was deeply depressed and addicted to cocaine. In November 2003, Kane was released from a hospital after a five-week stay. He had checked himself in because of his mental health problems. The doctors kept him hospitalized for five weeks because they thought he might try to take his own life. Kane wanted to stay with Shake, but she wanted to end the marriage. Although she did not want to be in a relationship with him, she did want to get him into a detox center. On November 30th, 2003, Kane and a counselor from his church went to his mother's home in Montreal. His estranged wife, Tammy Shake, was there. She was going to take him to a detox center. Kane and Shake got into an argument. Suddenly, Kane attacked 35-year-old Tammy Shake. He grabbed her by the hair and dragged her into the kitchen. He then started bashing the back of her head onto the floor. He then punched her repeatedly in the face. He then grabbed a knife and stabbed her in the face and neck. Kane's mother and the counselor tried in vain to stop the former pro football player, but they couldn't. Kane's mother called the police and he was arrested at the scene. Both the defense and the prosecution had a psychiatrist examine Kane. He claimed he had no memory of brutally murdering his wife and the mother of his four children. Both psychiatrists determined he had severe depression, cocaine addiction, and other personality problems. He lost control when he attacked Shake, therefore he had no intent to kill her. A year after the murder, 41-year-old Tommy Kane agreed to a plea deal. He pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter. The sentencing judge was critical of the plea deal. He thought that the murder was more likely the result of Kane being angry that Shake no longer wanted to be with him. He said that Kane acted out of pride, self-pity, and jealousy. He also thought that Kane checking himself into the hospital a month and a half before the murder was his way of trying to manipulate Shake to get back together with him. Tommy Kane was sentenced to 18 years of prison. In December 2015, after serving 11 years, Kane was granted day parole. A year later, he was granted full parole. In early 2019, Kane participated in the NFL's concussion settlement program. Seven years earlier, over 4,500 former NFL players and their families sued the NFL because the NFL did not tell them about the long-term effects of concussions. Later that year, in May 2019, Kane's parole officer asked him to do a urine test. He initially agreed, but didn't show up to do it. This violated the terms of his parole. He then admitted that he had used cocaine. So he was sent back to prison. What happened to Tommy Kane after he was sent back to prison is unclear. But he would have finished his sentence around 2021. By the time of this video, Tommy Kane is 60 years old. Number 2. Anthony Smith Anthony Wayne Smith was born in Elizabeth City, North Carolina on June 28, 1967. For three years, he played at the University of Alabama. 
He then transferred to the University of Arizona. In 1990, he was drafted 11th overall by the Los Angeles Raiders. He played defensive end for them for seven seasons. During his career, he had 57 and a half sacks and one safety. Anthony Smith started to get into serious trouble after he left the NFL. Early on February 13, 2003, a fire broke out at the Simply Sofas Furniture Store in Santa Monica, California. It caused $2.8 million in damage. It was determined that it was a case of arson. Someone had broken a window and then on a table they placed three five-gallon water bottles packed with rolled-up magazines, newspapers, and other mail. There was also gasoline in the bottles. Then the person lit the three bottles on fire. But the paper material inside the bottles didn't all burn. The police found that a lot of the material had been mailed to Anthony Smith and his wife. It turned out that Smith had a connection to the store. He had sold some items through consignment at the store. A few weeks before the fire, the store's owner and Smith had a dispute. She put a stop payment on a check because the item was damaged. But the owner didn't think it was enough of an argument to lead Smith to set her store on fire. The police questioned Smith. Smith couldn't explain how five years of his mail, newspapers, and periodicals ended up in the fire bombs. He was charged with arson. Smith went to trial in June 2004. It ended in a mistrial because the jury was deadlocked. Five jury members voted guilty and the other seven voted to acquit. The prosecution decided to retry Smith. His second trial was in December 2004. Once again, it ended in a hung jury. This time, only one jury member voted guilty. After that, the charges were dismissed. On October 7, 2011, the dead body of 31-year-old Marilio Pons was found outside Lancaster, California. He had been beaten and then shot twice in the head and eight times in the torso with a 9mm handgun. Pons was a hard-working family man. He met the woman who had become his wife while they were teenagers working at McDonald's. At the same time he was working at McDonald's, Ponce was working two other jobs and sending money home to his family in Mexico. He was helping pay his brother's university tuition. At the time of his murder, he owned his own diesel mechanic business. He had gone out the night before his body was found. Ponce told his wife that he was going to do business with a friend named Tony. The police got a hold of Ponce's phone records. Shortly before he was murdered, he had talked to three men several times. They were Charles Honest, Dewan White, and Anthony Smith. Honest and White's phones also pinged off a cell tower in Lancaster. The police went to Anthony Smith's condo. In one of his parking spots was Ponce's white navigator that he was driving on the night he was murdered but license plates from one of Smith's vehicles had been put on the navigator. The police searched Smith's home and car. They found some odd things. This included rope and zip ties. They also found several license plates, including government ones. There were also six baseball caps that read, Bail Enforcement or Fugitive Recovery Agent. Smith also had Ponce's cell phone. What the police didn't find was the murder weapon. Smith was questioned, and he said that Ponce was behind payments on the Navigator. He asked Smith to chop it and sell the parts. Then Ponce was going to report it stolen and collect the insurance money. He said that Ponce handed him the keys, but he didn't remember when he gave him the keys. The police didn't believe Smith. Notably, in the Navigator was Ponce's cell phone, a car seat for one of his children, and his wife's pocketbook. If Ponce wanted to stage a robbery for an insurance scam, he probably would not have left those items in there. When confronted, Smith had a new story about how he got the vehicle. He said that Ponce left it for him to pick up. He said he didn't see him on the night he was killed. Smith said that the night Ponce was killed, he was supposed to meet him because he had a job for him. 
Smith said the pawns dealt in truckloads of stolen goods and often asked him to sell the stuff. Smith claimed that night, Ponce was a no-show. The police continued to investigate the murder for two years. Then, in March 2011, 43-year-old Anthony Smith, 41-year-old Charles Honest, and 32-year-old Juan White were charged with murder. The district attorney didn't have much in the way of evidence. Notably, the murder weapon was never found. Smith was in possession of Ponce's vehicle and his cell phone. He told the police two different stories about how he came in possession of the vehicle. His stories didn't make sense. The police knew that Ponce was in his vehicle using his cell phone up until the murder. If that's the case, and Smith didn't kill Ponce, then how did he get the vehicle? Ponce couldn't have dropped it off because he was dead. So did the killer drop off the navigator? If so, why? But there were problems with the case. For example, none of the men's DNA or fingerprints were in the vehicle. The phone record showed that the three men were in the area where the body was found on the night of the murder. Also, all three men talked to Ponce shortly before he was killed. Smith's lawyer argued that Smith was innocent. Smith told the police that Ponce wanted to get rid of the vehicle for him because Ponce was behind on payments. A bank loan officer testified and said that Ponce and his wife had missed several payments on the loan for the vehicle. Charles Dawes and Dewan White were both found guilty of second-degree murder. Honest was sentenced to 35 years to life, and White was sentenced to 25 years to life. The jury deliberated for nine days regarding Smith's charges. They could not come to a unanimous decision. Eight had voted to convict, and four had voted to acquit. So a mistrial was declared. The district attorney decided they would try Smith again. Then in July 2016, before he went to trial, there was a shocking twist. Anthony Smith was charged with three more murders. The first murders happened 13 years earlier, about two years after he retired from football. Brothers Kevin and Ricky Nettles owned several businesses in Los Angeles. One of them was a car wash. On November 10, 1999, Kevin and Ricky were closing their businesses, which were across the road from each other. A large black man in a dark suit with what looked like a police badge on his belt pointed a gun at Kevin and handcuffed him. He put him in the back of a car that another man was driving. The man then got Ricky and handcuffed him. One of the employees asked the man where he was taking the brothers. The man said he was taking them downtown for questioning. The next day, the bodies of 34-year-old Kevin and 39-year-old Ricky Nettles were found eight miles apart from each other. Both had been tortured. Duct tape had been wrapped around their heads. They both had U-shaped burns on their cheeks. The medical examiner thought that they had been burned with a clothing iron. There were other burns on their abdomen and feet. Then they were both shot to death. The police reopened the case after a man contacted them and said he had been Anthony Smith's neighbor. He knew Smith to be short-tempered, especially with people who owed him money. One time Smith took the man to a storage unit. In the unit were knives, machine guns, silencers, bullets, zip ties, and police raid style jackets. Smith told him that they used the jackets when they robbed people. He then bragged that he had kidnapped and murdered two brothers who ran a car wash. The police checked their files and found the Nettles brothers' case file. The police then searched the storage unit and found jackets, zip ties, and some rope. The man also had information about another murder. The victim was his brother, 33-year-old Dennis Henderson. The man explained that he had introduced his brother to Smith. Smith bought marijuana and ecstasy from Henderson. Then they started hanging out. On June 25, 2001, Dennis Henderson and a friend were walking in the Mar Vista neighborhood of Los Angeles. Two armed men kidnapped them. The friend was dropped off in an alley. Later that day, 33-year-old Dennis Henderson's body was found in the back of a rental car. 
He had been stabbed 34 times, including once in the eye. His head had also been stomped on. On one of his wrists was a zip tie. There was also some rope on his body. The police determined that the zip tie came from the same batch as the zip ties in Smith's storage unit. Also, the rope was similar to the rope found in the storage unit. So in addition to the murder of Morello Ponds, Anthony Smith was also charged with the murders of Kevin and Ricky Nettles and Dennis Henderson. Anthony Smith went to trial for all four murders in November 2015. Months earlier, the two men who were convicted of Morello Ponce's murder, Juan White and Charles Onnes, had their convictions overturned because an appeals court determined there had not been enough evidence to convict them. They were released and not tried again. At Smith's trial for the four murders, in Ponce's case, the fact that Smith was in possession of Ponce's vehicle and cell phone were used as evidence. In the murder of the Nettles brothers, there were two witnesses. One was an employee who witnessed the brothers getting kidnapped by a man posing as a police officer. He testified that the man who kidnapped them was Smith. Another man was driving beside the car and he saw one of the nettles on the floor of the car. He also saw several guns in the car. He reported the incident to the police, but the police didn't follow up on it. He said the man he saw in the front passenger seat was Anthony Smith. The zip ties and rope were used as evidence in the murder of Dennis Henderson. The defense argued that there was no physical evidence like DNA or fingerprints and the murder weapons were never found. The jury deliberated for eight days. Smith was found guilty of three of the murders, the 2001 murders of Kevin and Ricky Nettles and the 1999 murder of Dennis Henderson. But the jury was deadlocked on Morello Ponce's 2008 murder. Nine had voted guilty, and the other three had voted to acquit. The jury also found that there were special circumstances in the three murder convictions. The special circumstances were torture, kidnapping, and multiple murders. That meant that Smith could have been sentenced to death. Instead, in January 2016, he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. At the time of this recording, the former defensive end for the Los Angeles Raiders is serving a sentence at the California Substance Abuse Treatment Facility in State Prison, Corcoran, in Corcoran, California. Number 3. Aaron Hernandez Aaron Hernandez was born in Bristol, Connecticut on November 6, 1989. Hernandez had a complicated relationship with his father. His father was abusive to Hernandez, his brother, and his mother. He also pushed Hernandez to achieve excellence in sports. Hernandez was afraid of his father, but also revered him and craved his approval. When Hernandez was 16, his father died from complications from a routine hernia surgery. Hernandez was devastated by the loss and he began to act out. He moved out of his mother's home and into the house of his cousin, Tanya Singleton. Months later, it came out that Singleton's husband was having an affair with Hernandez's mother. Singleton and her husband divorced and he moved in with Hernandez's mother. Hernandez was furious when he learned about the relationship. In high school, Hernandez started smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol. He also started dating Shay and Jenkins, whom he met in elementary school. However, according to several sources, Hernandez had other sexual partners. This includes a relationship with the quarterback of his football team. Initially, Hernandez committed to play tight end for the University of Connecticut, where his brother was the quarterback. But then he surprised everyone by going to play at the University of Florida. He played under coach Urban Meyer with quarterback Tim Tebow. In 2007, the first year Tebow and Hernandez played together, Tebow won the Heisman, the annual award for best college football player. During Hernandez's three years as a Florida Gator, he played 40 games. In 2008, the Gators won the 2008 BCS National Championship game. During his university career, Hernandez had 111 receptions for 1,382 yards and 12 touchdowns. 
Instead of playing his senior year, Hernandez entered the 2010 NFL Draft. Hernandez was not going to be allowed back on the team during his senior year because of his marijuana use. He had also been suspended in his junior year over his drug use. Coach Urban Meyer didn't want him to play his junior year, but Tebow convinced him to keep Hernandez on the team. When entering the draft, scouts thought that Hernandez had two major downsides. The first was that he was 6'2 and weighed 255 pounds, which is considered small for a tight end because someone that size may not be an effective blocker. The other was his off-field issues. Hernandez was known for partying and his marijuana use. He also had an anti-authority attitude. Yet, he was a talented player, so it was believed that he would be drafted in the second round. But the New England Patriots drafted him in the fourth round, 113th overall. That same year, the Patriots drafted another tight end in the second round, Rob Gronkowski. Hernandez and Gronkowski proved to be one of the best pairs of tight ends in NFL history. In 2010, Hernandez had 45 receptions. He got 563 yards and 6 touchdowns. The next season, the Patriots made it to the Super Bowl and they were defeated by the New York Giants. During the big game, Hernandez caught 8 passes for 67 yards and had a touchdown. He had 79 receptions for 910 yards and 7 touchdowns in the regular season. In August 2012, he signed a new contract with the Patriots for $39.58 million. This made him the second highest paid tight end in the NFL just after his teammate Rob Gronkowski. On November 6, 2012, Hernandez's 23rd birthday, his partner, Shayanna Jenkins, gave birth to a daughter. That same month, the couple got engaged and purchased a house in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. In the 2012 season, Hernandez only played 10 games. He missed three games because of an injury and one because of the birth of his daughter. Yet, he still managed to get 51 receptions for 483 yards and five touchdowns. On June 17, 2013, a teenager was jogging in an industrial park in North Attleboro, about a mile from Hernandez's home. He found the dead body of a man. The body was identified as 27-year-old Odin Lloyd. Lloyd was a semi-professional linebacker in the New England Football League. He had been shot six times. At the time of his murder, Lloyd had been dating Shiana Jenkins. Shiana is the sister of Hernandez's fiance, Shiana Jenkins. The police check Lloyd's phone records. Early on the morning his body was found, he sent several text messages to his sister. He wrote, Did you see who I'm with? He then wrote, NFL. This was followed by, Just so you know. Aaron Hernandez had texted Lloyd several times that night, saying he would pick him up. They were also recorded getting into the same car that night. Because of the connections to Hernandez, and he was the only person who lived in the area who knew Lloyd, he became the prime suspect. Close to the body was a blunt, which is a hollowed out cigar filled with marijuana. On the blunt was DNA belonging to Hernandez. When it hit the news that Hernandez was a suspect in the murder, an employee at a rental car company called the police. They had found something interesting in the car Hernandez had rented on the night of the murder. They found a spent shell casing and a piece of chewed up gum was attached to it. The casing matched one of the bullets used to kill Odin Lloyd. The gum had Hernandez's DNA on it. The police also learned that hours before the murder, Hernandez had purchased the same type of gum at a gas station. One thing that the police didn't find was the murder weapon. But the police believe they knew what happened to it. The day after the murder, Hernandez was at the police station being questioned by the police. He texted his fiance and told her that there was a box behind the screen in the movie room. Hours later, a surveillance camera at Hernandez's home recorded Shayanna Jenkins carrying a trash bag out of the house. The bag looked heavy and there was a clear outline of a box in the garbage bag. 
She had borrowed her sister's car that day because she told her sister that she wanted to get money to pay the housekeepers. Shanna's sister was Odin Lloyd's girlfriend. The housekeeper said that this didn't make any sense because they were paid by check. Shanna put the garbage bag in the trunk and left for a while. When she returned, she didn't have the bag. The housekeeper said that she was upset when she returned. Shanna later said that she thought there was marijuana in the box. She said she threw the garbage bag in a random dumpster. On June 26, 2013, nine days after the murder, the police arrested 23-year-old Aaron Hernandez for the murder of 27-year-old Odin Lloyd. About an hour and a half later, the Patriots released Hernandez. The next day and the following day, the police made two other arrests in connection with the murder of Odin Lloyd. They were 28-year-old Carlos Ortiz and 42-year-old Ernest Wallace. They were acquaintances of Hernandez from Bristol. On the day of the murder, Hernandez attacks them and asks them to come to North Attleboro. There was surveillance footage of them getting into Hernandez's rented car. Two days after Hernandez was arrested, the police searched his cousin's home. Hernandez's cousin, Tanya Singleton, was one of Hernandez's closest family members. The police found something surprising in the garage. It was a silver Toyota 4Runner with Rhode Island plates. It was an interesting find because the police were looking for the vehicle because it had been used in a double homicide in Boston, Massachusetts 11 months earlier. On the night of July 16, 2012, 29-year-old Daniel Brew and 28-year-old Sofia Furtado were at a nightclub in South Boston. Afterward, they left in their vehicle. A person driving the Toyota 4Runner pulled up to them. Someone in the SUV yelled racial slurs at the two men. Then, someone in the SUV fired five shots into the car. Then the SUV took off. Debru and Furtado were both killed. The police reviewed surveillance footage from the club. They saw Hernandez entering the club and then exiting the club ten minutes later, shortly after the two men left. Hernandez was with another man. The police learned that four days before the murder of Odin Lloyd, a man named Alexander Bradley had filed a lawsuit against Hernandez. Bradley was a drug dealer and he had been a good friend of Hernandez. In the lawsuit, Bradley claimed that on February 13, 2013, he was at a strip club in Miami, Florida with Hernandez. He said that after the club, Hernandez was driving and he was in the passenger seat. At some point, he dozed off. When he woke up, Hernandez was pointing a gun at him. Hernandez then shot him in the forehead. Afterward, Hernandez dumped him in an industrial park. But Bradley survived the shooting. He lost his right eye and he had to have reconstructive surgery on his face. At the time, Bradley didn't cooperate with the police investigation into his shooting. Instead, he wanted to get revenge on Hernandez. Before filing the suit, he tried to extort Hernandez, and then he threatened to kill him. Hernandez's agent tried to sell the matter quietly. Bradley wanted $5 million, and Hernandez counted with a million and a half. Bradley then asked for $2.5 million. Hernandez didn't respond. Instead, he went to see a lawyer. The police determined that Alexander Bradley was the man with Aaron Hernandez on the night Daniel De Brew and Safira Furtado were killed. In September 2013, a judge ordered Bradley to testify in front of the grand jury, but he didn't show up. A few weeks later, he was arrested. Bradley eventually cooperated with the investigators. He said the night De Brew and Furtado were killed, he was at the club with Hernandez. While they were there, Debru accidentally bumped into Hernandez and Hernandez spilled a drink. Hernandez got angry. Bradley convinced him to step outside to calm down. Then they got into the SUV and Hernandez spotted Debru and Furtado. Hernandez convinced Bradley to follow them. When they pulled up beside their car, Hernandez, who was in the passenger seat, yelled at the two men and then shot them. The police theorized that Hernandez shot Bradley because he could expose him for the murder of the two men. 
As for why Hernandez killed the two men, it was simply because one of them had bumped into him and spilled his drink. By his own admission, Hernandez had serious anger issues. On a phone call from jail, he said that he was angry all the time. The police also learned that when Hernandez was 17 years old and a freshman at the University of Florida, he had been questioned in another shooting. On September 30th, 2007, three men left a Gainesville, Florida nightclub. As they were sitting in their car, a man walked up to them and fired five shots into the vehicle. One man was shot in the back of the head and another one was shot in the arm. The man sitting in the back was unharmed. The man in the back seat said that the shooter was a large man who was either Hispanic or Hawaiian and he had a lot of tattoos. He was shown a photo lineup which contained a picture of Aaron Hernandez. The man picked Hernandez as the shooter. Also, Hernandez had been at the same nightclub as the three men and they had gotten into an argument. Hernandez was brought in for questioning. The police were surprised when they walked into the interrogation room and found Hernandez with his head down on the table and he was sleeping. Hernandez refused to talk to the police and asked for a lawyer. Hernandez was not charged at the time. After Hernandez was arrested for the murder of Odin Lloyd, the police reopened the investigation. On May 15, 2014, Hernandez was indicted for the murders of David Brew and Furtado. What shocked many people is that this shooting happened six weeks before Hernandez signed the $40 million contract with the Patriots. He then played an entire season. Aaron Hernandez's trial for the murder of Odin Lloyd started on January 9, 2015. The evidence against him included text messages indicating that Hernandez would meet up with Lloyd that night. There was also the video that showed them getting into the same car. The DNA on the blunt was also used as evidence. There was also the chewing gum, which Hernandez purchased and had his DNA on it, that was stuck to the spent shell casing from a bullet that killed Lloyd that was in Hernandez's rental car that he was driving on the night of the murder. What the police didn't know was why Hernandez killed Lloyd. There was some speculation that Lloyd found out something about Hernandez's sexuality and Hernandez was worried that Lloyd might expose him. Or it's possible that Hernandez felt Lloyd was being disloyal, or there was something that Lloyd did that angered Hernandez, who, by many accounts, was incredibly paranoid. The trial lasted 11 weeks. The jury deliberated for 36 hours over 7 days. Aaron Hernandez was found guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life without parole. His lawyer filed an appeal. In May 2016, Ernest Wallace was acquitted of first-degree murder, but he was found guilty of being an accessory after the fact. He was sentenced to four and a half years to seven years in prison. Two months later, in June 2016, Carlos Ortiz agreed to a plea deal. In exchange for dropping the first-degree murder charge, he pleaded guilty to being an accessory after the fact. Like Wallace, he was sentenced to four and a half to seven years in prison. Hernandez's trial for the murders of Daniel Debru and Safiro Furtado began on February 14, 2017. For this trial, Hernandez had hired a new lawyer, Jose Baez. Baez gained international recognition when he defended Casey Anthony against the first-degree murder charge and the death of her two-year-old daughter, Kaylee. Casey Anthony was found not guilty. The star witness at this trial was Alexander Bradley. Jose Baez painted him as the killer of the two men. The trial lasted seven and a half weeks. The jury deliberated for 37 hours over six days. Aaron Hernandez was acquitted of both murders. He was found guilty on a single charge, unlawful possession of a firearm. He was sentenced to four to five years in prison. Three days after the trial ended, Reporter Michelle McAfee appeared on the Kirk and Callahan sports radio show in Boston. During the show, they implied that Hernandez was gay. Two days later, on April 19, 2017, 27-year-old Aaron Hernandez was found dead in his cell. He had hanged himself with his bed sheets. 
written in red ink on his forehead, was John 3.16. John 3.16 is a Bible passage which reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. People thought it was odd that Hernandez would kill himself while his case was still being appealed. There is speculation he did it because of the doctrine of abatement. The legal principle is that if someone is convicted and dies before their appeal is heard, their status would return to their pre-trial status. In this case, Hernandez's first degree murder conviction was erased, meaning he legally died an innocent man. Hernandez wrote three suicide notes. One was for his fiancée, Shayanna Jenkins. In it, he wrote that she would be rich. Part of Hernandez's contract with the New England Patriots was that $15.95 million was guaranteed. The Patriots didn't pay out most of his contract because they released him after he was arrested for murder. But technically, since Hernandez's conviction was erased, he could never be tried for murder again because he was dead. Some people believe that Hernandez killed himself so that the Patriots would pay his fiancée and daughter and they would be set for life. However, many people thought that the Patriots organization would spend more legal fees in the fight not to give her any more money. The district attorney appealed the decision to vacate the conviction. In March 2019, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court reinstated the conviction. The same week that Hernandez died, the police in Gainesville cleared him of the shooting that happened in 2007 that resulted in two people being injured. Several witnesses refuted the passenger's description of the shooter. The passenger said he was a Hispanic or Hawaiian man, but several witnesses said that the shooter was a black man with cornrows or dreadlock style hair. No one else saw Hernandez in the area. The police re-interviewed the witness and he recanted his identification of Hernandez. He said that he thought it was Hernandez because they had argued with him at the bar. Hernandez's family agreed to donate his brain so it could be examined. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, better known as CTE, is caused by repeated head injuries. According to neurologist Dr. Ann McKee, an expert in CTE who examined Hernandez's brain, there are four stages of CTE. Stage 1 is asymptomatic or mild memory and depressive symptoms. Stage 2 is symptoms including behavioral outbursts and severe depression. Stage 3 is cognitive deficits including memory loss and executive dysfunction. Stage 4 is advanced language deficits, psychotic symptoms, profound cognitive deficits, and problems with motor features. McKee said that Hernandez's brain was at stage 3. She had never seen such extreme CTE in a brain of someone younger than 46. But many people do not think that CTE is to blame for Hernandez's actions. They point out that thousands of people have CTE and do not murder people. For many people, they believe there was a combination of factors that led Hernandez down the path he took. This includes an unstable family life while growing up, his struggles with his sexual identity, and the CT that led to problems with impulse control and problems with decision making. But it's impossible to say why Aaron Hernandez did the things he did. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.